Hey, supply chainers, wherever you are in the world, this is Sarah Barnes Humphrey with you today. Are you ready? Let's talk supply chain. Hello, everyone, and happy Tuesday. Welcome to Thoughts and Coffee. My name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey, and I am the host of Let's Talk Supply Chain, the Blended podcast, and also the founder of the Blended Pledge. Super excited to be here with you today. We've got Audrey Ross back on the stage. She's going to be giving us a market update. Plus, she did a really cool post the other day about um, reusing fashion and and fast fashion and what it's doing. And we're going to be talking all about that coming up. Plus, I think we're going to try to go live on the Let's Talk Supply Chain Instagram right after we end here as well. So if you're not following Let's Talk Supply Chain on Instagram, go and follow us and then be part of the conversation with us after we finish here. All right. What have we got to talk about? Well, we've got a brand new episode. So this is episode 308. And I talked to Dirk from Ideal Warehouse Innovations about safety in the workplace. Now, we all know you know, warehouses can, we can have some troubles in the warehouse and um, we can, there's safety issues all over the supply chain. Well, Ideal Warehouse Innovations, they help keep you and your teams and your workplaces safe. Like, honestly, I didn't even know half of what we were talking about until that day. And I learned so much from this episode. So go and check that out wherever you subscribe to Let's Talk Supply Chain. Um, you can find it on Let's Talk Supply Chain.com. You can also find it on our YouTube channel. All right, what else is happening? We just finished the Sifted mini series. So, if you guys haven't heard me talk about this, the Sifted mini series, we uh, talked about driving your parcel performance. Now, with everybody getting inundated from FedEx and UPS about how the prices are going to go up in January, how are you going to cover those costs? I mean, those are the conversations that I'm having with people right now. These episodes will change that for you. You actually might not need need to increase your prices. You might not have to take the increase that they're giving you, but what you might need to do is implement the sifted technology. So go and check that out. I think it's episode, what have we got here? Because 307 was the last one. So it's episode 303, 304, 305, and 307. And that's over on letstalksupplychain.com as well, or wherever you subscribe to the show. What else do we have going on? Oh, yes. This is, wow, we've got lots of people going live right now. We have got a game show coming up. So that's right. Mark your calendars for December 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern because we are going to go live with Superstar Game Face. Now, we've got some of the faces that you know and love from Let's Talk Supply Chain. We've got some brand new faces that are going to be joining us and we're going to be playing some fun games. We're going to be doing some supply chain trivia and a whole lot more. So mark Mark your calendars. We are going to come out, I think, tomorrow with the LinkedIn Live event page that we're going to be tagging all of you guys to come and join us because this is going to be a lot of holiday fun. And I cannot wait for you guys to see that. Now, did you see Hope White's No Bullshipping show last Friday? Well, if you didn't, you need to go and check it out under the No Bullshipping playlist on Let's Talk Supply Chain YouTube. She had a lawyer on there talking about trademarking, talking about what you need to know if you're an entrepreneur in this space. Um, and so if you didn't go and check it out, go and check it out because she had a lot of really amazing information on that particular show. All right. Well, that's it for me and what's happening at Let's Talk Supply Chain. Now it's time to bring up my trade bestie. Hello. Hello, Audrey. Hi. How are you today? Good, good. Busy, good. busy. Sorry? Busy, busy. I know. It's super busy. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're what? At the end of November, and we still got to do some deliveries to get those things on the shelves. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> I'm actually on vacation this week, but. Oh, are you actually taking vacation? Mm -hmm. 
Good. Well, trying to. For you. I'm so excited for you. All right. So for anybody who doesn't know you, give us the 411. Who are you? What do you do? Yeah. Uh, so I'm currently the import and export trade compliance manager at Orchard Custom Beauty, which is a business to business um, private labeling company specializing in cosmetics, beauty tools, and bath accessories. Um, I'm right now trying, we have our last event with Fashion Group International uh, this evening. So I'm been working away on that and uh, we've got our organization for women in international trade luncheon on thursday um so getting getting ready for for some events this week um and then hopefully it'll be a quiet december <laughs> that's what's going on with me that's who i am <laughs> hoping for a quiet december that's me i'm hoping for a quiet december too although what we're going to be talking about today means that supply chain issues are kind of the norm so i don't know anymore <laughs> yeah all right, let's get to our poll of the week and then we're going to talk about some of that fast fashion and do a little bit of a market update. So the poll that we had was for the holiday in the US last week, what is the best Thanksgiving food? So 37% of you said turkey. I mean, I don't know if I'm surprised by that. 34% of you said stuffing, 21% of you said pumpkin pie and other said 9%. What is your favorite, Audrey? I mean, I know it's been a month for us since we've had our Thanksgiving, yeah, but we're probably going to have some of this coming up for Christmas. So what's your yeah, favorite? We, yeah, we have ours like six weeks earlier, but I mean, we eat the similar similar foods because it's about sort of harvest and, and you know, farming. Um, I voted for pumpkin pie because I That's love it. Favorite? I love pumpkin pie. Do you love pumpkin everything? Like you do the pumpkin no. sauce No, no. Just the pumpkin no. pie. Just the pie. <laughs> okay. I like. I, there's a pumpkin curry soup I like. Um, but yeah, pumpkin spice everything, and it gets nutty here with the pumpkin spice. It pumpkin spice Cheerios, pumpkin spice pop tarts, pumpkin spice like uh -huh. it's. Yeah. You know. I don't think I like it that much. Anyways, Alicia says tamales. Michael says all of the above. Christian says wine. Yes, especially well, in okay. We can always go oh. with the wine. Yeah. Christine says mashed potatoes. I like that too. I would have my Jessica, best friend's reply, yeah. <laughs> says buffalo chicken dip with Tostitos. Oh, I love how it's like there's sort of like the state. It's like you got the turkey, you got the mashed potatoes, the stuffing, and then there's like an add-in that every fam kind of has. So mm -hmm. sometimes my family does cabbage rolls because of our, like, our Ukrainian mm -hmm. background. Um, yeah, it's fun. Bruce says anything but turkey. Anyways, I have way too much fun going through the oh, comments Bruce. of these polls because of what people put. I love it. Somebody else said green bean casserole. Anyways, mm -hmm. um, thank you so much to everybody who participated in the poll. We're going to have a new one for you tomorrow morning. We ask a question every single Wednesday morning. So give us a bit of a uh, market update and then we'll get into your fashion post. What is happening right now? What are you seeing? I know that there's been a couple of posts recently about how LA and Long Beach have been completely cleaned up, which is mm -hmm. amazing news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. I know there's some other U.S. ports that are not. Um, so some of the ports that people had diverted to or maybe they changed their lanes to, um, you know, like Savannah and Norfolk and, um, you know, Miami, Tacoma, some of the other sort of, um, you know, not as not as sort of large ports um, are getting getting a bit of congestion. Um, we're finding, you know, I'm finding I'm going into December. Um, I'm trying to pre-plan trucks for pickups because finding trucks in December as people start to take holidays, usually at the end of the year, people haven't used their vacation. So all of a sudden they're off for a week. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so that's, that's the bigger challenge. I think if you do anything where it's multimodal is going to be finding trucks and drivers. Um, into Canada is still a bit of a hot mess, not if you're moving containers, but if you're moving any LCL, um, the rail situation is still a bit, um, still not fun. Um, still hasn't quite resolved. And we're going into winter season where if the weather is as it normally is, we go into a slowdown, right? Cause you have the, the ice on the tracks and you have that snow clearing, you have shorter trains. Um, so that's not ideal. Um, but this time of year, that's not, um, unexpected. What else? We've seen some lockdowns in China, but we're doing some pickups still. Um, yeah, lots going on as usual. You got to know your route. You have to know your routes. Well, and the rail strike it could 
potentially be a big deal. So not only yes. the ice and the weather, <laughs> but actually people um, shutting down yeah. the rail lines and people, it's not just product that we are going to have a challenge with. It's also people getting to and from work that use those rail lines as well. Yeah. That U S that U S rail um it's, it's a big, it's a big issue because like right now I don't use a ton of U S rail. I use trucks, but I'm not going to be able to get those trucks if everybody's right. trying to use trucks. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So those in trucking pay very close attention, or I guess everybody play, pay everybody very really. close attention to what is happening yeah. with the rail right now. All yeah. right. So you posted this. I think um, Oh, it was three days ago. Okay. I was going to say yesterday. That's how much I know of <laughs> what day it is today. <laughs> I posted it on, I think, on Black Friday. You definitely <laughs> did post yeah. it on Black Friday. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about this because sure. I really liked your perspective on this. And I think that it's great that we're calling this out because too much of the time we are focused on fast fashion and it's leaked itself, mm -hmm. not only from the mm -hmm. red carpet, but into what everybody is wearing on a daily basis and can't wear the same thing on in an Instagram photo. Yes. Yeah. It's become a, a it's become a deep cultural point. Um, so this was an Instagram post by a, um, a stylist, Elizabeth Stewart, who, um, a stylist to the stars, obviously here's Kate Blanchett, one of, you know, the greatest movie actresses of our time. Um, and so she was rewearing and rewearing is, you know, people talk about rewearing, rewearing happens. Um, you see the, 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 um, the princess of Wales, the new, new princess of Wales, she rewears you know, her coats, her shoes, just famously wearing her Reese pumps, you know, for, for a decade now, um, which is great. But this was notable because one, it wasn't, it wasn't, she had worn the dress. She'd worn the dress in like 2020. She'd worn the dress before, but it was also that she wore it this twice in a week. So it was noticeable, mm -hmm. noticeable from sort of a, a style perspective of like, didn't she wear that like two days ago? Um, but then there's the the sort of two points, the sort of cultural connotation, this deep culture um, that we've built up of everyone now trying to be like a celebrity or a, a, a wealthy person and not wear the same outfit twice, which, you know, before that was almost impossible. There's no way you could afford um, to be wearing. I mean, this is a, a, a like a McQueen, I believe. I mean, this dress is $5,000 and Kate didn't pay for it. You know, it's loaned to her. Mm -hmm. um, but so there was no way for the regular population to keep up until fast fashion came in. And of course, now you have these, these sort of pieces that are $15, $30, which you're like, how can it be $30 for a sweater? That's nuts. Um, but here we are. And then the second piece of this, um, and what was interesting, what caught my eye and why, and in the stylist pointing this out, is not that she was doing the rewearing, um, which is notable, but that the stylist made a point to mention how in her job as a stylist, they don't pull one, one sort of dress. Yes. They pull multiple outfits and those outfits, not just the dress, but the accessories, the other pieces of the garment, the shoes, the jewelry are pulled from all over the world because they aren't just sitting necessarily in a store. They could be with other stylists. They could be on photo shoots. It could be in other boutiques. So she's pulling you know, by like, by express courier, multiple 30 to 50 pieces, let's say, every time she's showing a client, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, an, an outfit um, sort of routine. So that was what was notable is that she was saying like, how, what is the environmental impact? And if we can stop doing this, like, shipping everything from everywhere, and then having them choose maybe one or two things, and then sending everything back, um, and I think in our industry, we see those returns, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then we see that new, you know, we see that people are concerned about carbon and, and what does that look like? So anyways, well, no, and I think it was amazing. And I'm <laughs> glad that you um, gave us, you know, an insight into a, a variety of different reasons as to why this is important. I mean, a lot of times we're hearing about the celebrities use of private planes. Yeah. But rarely do we ever hear about the logistics of a garment or yeah. an accessory that somebody actually wears on a red carpet. And what does that look like? Yeah. Because like you said, there's multiple pieces moving all around the world consistently to different people to try to get their product or garment on the red carpet. 
And so the logistics of that is just massive. And it's not something that we talk a lot about. And, you know, for celebrities who are looking for that environmental reduction in carbon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if we're calling them out on the use of private planes, we also need to be calling them out on the logistics of how they're getting their garments and their accessories to be on the red carpet. So I think I I just love that because it's not something that we ever really think about all the time. One of those behind the scenes that we kind of don't, you know, we see them in these, these fantastical, beautiful outfits. And Mm -hmm. there's, there's some talk about how it happens that they use stylists. Most of them don't dress themselves. There's some talk about how most of these outfits are free. Mm -hmm. They're not buying them at the store like the rest of us. Um, And then there is that piece where as a culture, we've gotten caught up in thinking that we can emulate this kind of behavior and you're like I don't I can't get an Alexander McQueen dress like every week and and have a different Instagram photo like you know and I'm wearing a top that I've had for 15 years (laughs) (laughs) well you just put you just put it on live tv (laughs) Um, you'll see it again I'll probably wear it tomorrow like (laughs) (laughs) I want to give a shout out to Audria D and Ahmed over on my personal LinkedIn. Thanks so much for tuning in with us today. All right. So I think we need to get to our first uh, article. What do you think? So this one is from ESG Today, and it's about Volvo and the electric cars that or the, sorry, the electric trucks that they are putting yes. together. Now, they're delivering the first trucks containing fossil free steel. Now, this is the first time I've kind of heard of this. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, because at the end of the day, you've got the electric car that's supposed to be better for the environment anyways. But it's actually the materials that go into making this truck that are fossil free. So the fossil free steel, which is Uh, what's used to make the truck is making even more of an impact than the electric vehicle itself. So steel makers are the biggest of the CO2 um, emitters, uh, greenhouse gases of seven to 9% um, of emissions come from steel makers. And so that's why fossil free steel is really, really, really important. And so they are, they are creating 44 ton trucks. So again, they're electric, and made of fossil free steel and amazon is going to be one of their first customers you can see here with this truck here it's an amazon truck that they've put together um unilever are also going to be one of their first customers as well and so this is one way uh that you know all of the larger companies who have said that they want to be carbon neutral by 2040 this is one of the ways that they're doing it is by the construction of the trucks that they're building so electric, fossil-free steel, and then I'm sure it's probably going to be autonomous at some point as well. (laughs) What did you think of this? I love it. I'm here for it. And all of these little shifts and changes that everyone's make that are sort of starting to come to fruition, like we can see them in the market, is fantastic because we really need to see these kinds of, these kinds of, um, infrastructure changes and and it's and it's interesting because we again we'll talk a lot about the products that we have in hand and about what their their impact is like okay, we're not using straws anymore we're, we're trying you know we don't want to use plastic cutlery or single-use plastics um <laughs> and uh and then the, but this styles it back it's like okay you have you, you know what's what's the product well it's the truck and then what about what's inside the truck what's what's created the truck um, so this is fantastic um, to see from Volvo, who's, I mean, you know, they've been around for a while. So, mm-hmm. Bayram, I see you. Um, Nicole, can we put the link in YouTube as well so that they can go and check the link for this article as well? Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I think it's interesting, right? We just talked about the logistics of a garment. We just talked mm-hmm. about the logistics of accessories, but then we also need to think about how they're made, where they're made. What does that look like? Yeah. Are we thinking about all of these things, right? There's a lot to really consider when we're making a purchase or buying or making a buying decision. Um, and I think this is kind of an eye opener as to the, you know, what they're using, the materials that they're using to yeah. actually create 
new products for the market. This one specifically is a truck, which is huge, right? Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of trucks on the road. There's a lot of trucks emitting a lot of CO2 and, and, you know, we've got to bring that down. And so how do we do that? And so seeing collaboration like this between Amazon, Unilever and Volvo to be able to really do that hopefully is going to make a difference and start people thinking about the innovation and what we can do in other areas. And what does that look like? What can the fossil free steel be used for um, to make products moving forward? I guess the the question is, I would have is how long does it take? Where do we find it? (laughs) And how much is available so that we can start making additional products out of it? Yeah, for sure. The capacity piece is key. Mm -hmm. All right. So our second article, I don't know why, but this week I am on a auto kick. (laughs) (laughs) But I saw this come out. Um, Originally, I had a Financial Times uh, article. So if you guys have a subscription to the Financial Times, go and search this particular um, title in the Financial Times. But I had to subscribe. Anyways, we ended up with Reuters um, and their particular article on Volkswagen talking about how supply chain problems are now the rule, not the exception. We started talking about this last week with Ashley from Sleep Number in how they have really started with their last mile delivery, the customer experience and what they want it to look like, and then moved it up the chain for their resilient supply chain and how they're going to tackle supply chain problems um, as they arise, because she also confirmed that supply chain problems are now the rule, not the exception. So if you missed that last week on Thoughts and Coffee, go and check it out on our YouTube page, because it was a really, really great discussion. And honestly, we probably should have continued that one on (laughs) on Instagram because she had a lot of really great things to say. But this particular article, so right now Volkswagen is sitting with 150,000 unfinished cars because of the lack of products. I think the other thing to note on this article as well is that they've created a new business unit that's evaluating threats. Mm -hmm. So I want to let that sit, right? Because we've got a lot of um, cuts that are happening throughout the industry. But there's also a lot of new jobs and new business units that are being created around these supply chain problems that I want to bring to your attention because this is huge, right? Um, Evaluating the threats, gathering data so they're able to forecast and minimize the risk that they have from the supply chain threats. So I thought that was really interesting. And then the other thing that it says is that they're focusing on energy supply. So they don't predict that in the winter with all of the um, energy supply challenges that they're talking about in Europe, they don't think that that's going to affect them because they're actually focusing on their energy supply and how they be um, a little bit more self-sufficient and not reliant on that particular, um, and I, so I don't know if that's solar or not. It doesn't actually say in this article, but I'm assuming that a lot of people are going to take control back or a lot of organizations are going to take control back where they can take control back. And I would assume that we're going to see more on, on solar panels, but they're also stockpiling critical components. Now I know you didn't have a chance to really read this article because I sent you the financial times, but out of everything that I've just sort of talked about, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's key. I mean, they're talking about some of the fundamentals for supply chain is to look at, um, you know, go as as far along your chain as you can, have an intentional design, um, focus on risk management. Um, You know, we we spent the last, we had spent, you know, some time where things seemed to work well. So we all just kind of followed along. um, And we didn't, we weren't maybe as intentional or mindful about our supply chain as we needed to be um, in the face of the fact that there are often um, global wide issues that, that affect um, not only our supply chain, but every supply chain. So they're, they're, they're intent to really focus on these risks and, and have, um, you know, have that, you know, full understanding through data collection and use utilizing the data that they probably already have on hand um, that's key. And, and it's an interesting direction to go in. It's not a surprise for an automaker to make that move um, because it's, it's been a f- extremely challenging um, for their industry. 
And then yes, that reliance on, you know, maybe the amount of, of third party vendors that they're relying on, they might tighten that up. Um, looking at the infrastructure changes that they can make around where they're getting their energy consumption, how their factories are running themselves, are they running themselves efficiently? That's key. That's something we should we should all be all be looking at, you know, periodically. How mm -hmm. how efficiently are we running? How are we using our resources? And the fact that it's like, oh, we have this ton of resources, infinite supply, no problems, everything's going great. Um, you know, for for supply chainers, it's a little bit naive for us to kind of continue that way. So. Well, and you know, thinking about when you're taking a look at your supply chain teams and who you need on that team, you need somebody that understands the technology, but then you also need to have somebody on your team that can understand the threats and what it actually means to your business. Because yeah. there's some people who are going to be in the business firefighting every single day, but then you have to have other people that are sort of looking at it from different perspectives to really mitigate that risk and help you do that. And I think, you know, once we take a look at our supply chain teams and what is needed and, you know, the different roles that we can actually yeah. put together to really make a, um, uh, you know, a difference in what we're doing yeah. within the supply chain and the organization. I think that's going to mm -hmm. be key. Now, mm -hmm. this last article is about uh, friend shoring. So yeah. we have talked about it as a collective group around the word friend shoring. We've also heard and talked about sure shoring. There's a lot of buzzwords around this. And I wanted to bring it up. This is interesting because it comes from the India Times. And so yeah. they're talking about friend shoring. But the definition of it is relocating supply chain where the risk of disruption from political chaos is low which I didn't know <laughs> was the definition of it, well, but apparently it is. But talk to me about this friend shoring. Is it just a buzzword or is it actually going to stick? It's, it's seemingly American economic policy or American trade policy coming straight mm -hmm. from Janet Yellen. Um, but it's also, it's not, it's not just at low econ country risk. Friend shoring was specifically referring to countries that the Americans are allies with. Mm -hmm. So choose to focus on if you are going to use, if you aren't going to localize and, and onshore, reshore your goods back to the U.S., then choose to work with countries who the U.S. is allies with. That was sort of my, more my interpretation and what I've seen from it and from the speech last April from Janet Yellen. Um, and then, and, and that's an interesting, that's an interesting idea. That's something that has been seen before. Um, and that's something that is encouraged, you know, when countries have free trade agreements with other countries, obviously you're like, oh, well, we're, we're clearly out. friends because we set up a whole free trade agreement and did the work. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I mean, we're in Canada, we're, we're sort of lucky because we have like 26 or 27 free trade agreements with different mm -hmm. countries. So it g gives us quite a wide, wide reach um, in terms of who our friends are um, that, uh you know, but, but the reality of, you know, it's just another, it's, it's a push along the way to, to move from, from China as your manufacturing that, you know, as being your only source for manufacturing raw materials and also, um, and also no, it near shoring is when you're bringing stuff closer to where you or your customers are. And friend shoring is just choosing to do business with a country who your country has a relationship with. Friends so it's not necessarily, um, I have a thought on that, Larry. It's not necessarily <laughs> that, it, it, you know, it's not necessarily that it's about your business. It's more about economic po or trade policy at the, at the political level where your government is going to maybe encourage through free trade agreements or through other agreements that you select certain countries or facilitate you in working with certain countries. Um, yeah, sure shoring is something people don't talk about it, but I think I prefer it as a term because it really doesn't isolate you into this like, oh, well, friend shoring really is sort of like, I, I'm not friends with countries. I do business with other businesses. So that sort of doesn't quite fit for what my business model is going to be. It's a nice to have, um, but not a necessary. Whereas sure shoring, I think really encapsulates the sustainability, security, um, you know, and, and design that most businesses are looking for. So I would say that's a term that's, that's still, I think, more valuable. 
I agree with you. I love the short shoring term. But anyways, we are coming down to the end of the show. Yeah, hashtag sure shoring. Just and if you are following Let's Talk Supply Chain on Instagram, Audrey and I are going to hop off from here and go on to there. And we'd love yeah. to continue the conversation with you. But before we go, we do have some upcoming events that I want to talk to you about. So we are going live with a merge. Who's in the driver's seat with your supply chain? December 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern. So we are going to have that event page up, I think, tomorrow. So make sure you click the attend button for that. And then, of course, we've got all of our live shows. So action items with DC. We've got Manifest coming up at the end of January. TPM is coming up February to March. I'm going to be at TPM Tech, and then I'm also going to be at TPM as well. And uh, that's about it for all of our events. And that's about it for all of us today. Thank you so much for joining us. And Audrey, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Have a great week, everyone. Have a great week.